Chato, un producto que está en el sueño. Sí, Okay, so uh, today I was asked to explain to you what I'm doing to my servers when I first get the Linux on. So before we start with this, uh, as we said, uh, I'm a chief system architect of uh, SiteGround. I'm there more than 10 years. Uh, SiteGround is one of the largest hosting companies in the world. We are uh, one of the top five. I don't know which one, but we are one of the top five. Uh, don't worry if you haven't heard of us, because uh, we are not working uh, in Bulgaria. Actually, we don't search for customers. So, as we are so big, uh, we have uh, thousands of servers that we have to administer and a lot of things that we have to automate. I am system administrator professionally uh, since uh, 96. I uh, started with Linux in 95. So, uh, I have a lot of experience there. Uh, in my spare time, I organize OpenFest, which is uh, Bulgaria's biggest uh, false conference, free open source conference. And uh, keep in mind that when I say biggest, it's like 3,000 attendees. <laughs> it's uh, huge. <laughs> Uh, I also organize the Bulgarian Pearl Workshops and uh, Linux User Group Bulgaria Meetings and attend a lot of other uh, conferences. Except that, I'm also teaching uh, Linux System Administration and Network Security courses in Sofia University and in Software. So, why do you need a server at home? Most people think of servers uh, like machines like this iron here that uh, are clumsy and uh, not very user-friendly. But uh, think of them as a Raspberry Pi. Who here knows what Raspberry Pi is? Okay, so a server is a Raspberry Pi. Uh, how many of you actually have Linux? Okay, so Now, uh, I'll try to convince you to install Linux on something <laughs> after this talk. So the first thing that uh, you would really want uh, for uh, a server at home is uh, storage to keep your uh, pictures, documents, uh, music, movies, stuff like this. Uh, usually you guys uh, keep them on your laptops or on your desktop machines, but if you want to share them with someone, now uh, it's the tricky part. You have to share folders, uh, allow them permissions, and a lot of stuff that sometimes simply don't work and you give out a hard drive to the guy and okay, this is your movie, <laughs> play it. <laughs> or uh, this is our coursework, <laughs> work on it. <laughs> when you have a server at home, you can actually share this uh, via internet or via the local network, uh, sh share all this data and also control who have access and it's easier controlling it. Also, uh, if you're a network geek, what you can do on Linux is uh, make it a router. What we are doing for our team buildings, and uh, our team buildings are for 400 people. When we go to somewhere, we actually have the whole hotel. And uh, we take over their network. So we ask the network guy to come uh, uh, to the reception. We explain that we want access to their server room, we want uh, to have access to their cables, we don't want their network equipment, we actually bring our own network equipment. And what's happening is that we have two laptops, two laptops that are our uh, routers for the team building. They are tested and they can uh, route one gigabit without a problem. So. Uh, some people really don't understand that, uh, but uh, with a single la uh, one card, uh, you can actually route multiple interfaces without a problem if you have a good switch to connect your laptop to. So, uh, even with a small Raspberry Pi, you can create a very nice, interesting router on your, uh, at your home, and you can do a lot of uh, good things like better firewall than most of the things that you get at home. 
Uh, also, if you have multiple ISPs at all, which is not uncommon for uh, nerds, uh, you can share the internet connection. So if you have uh, 50 megabits from uh, one ISP and 100 megabits from another ISP, with the Linux router, you can actually combine this to 150 megabits per second for your uh, connection at home. And you can actually do this on Raspberry Pi, but 150 maybe it will be a little bit trickier than normal laptop. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, you can host your own projects. Uh, some of you are hosting uh, at uh, hosting companies like ours, but you, if you have internet at home, you actually can host your sites at home. You can host your um, automation projects at home. And home automation is something that I'm doing at home for maybe six, seven years. And by home automation, uh, think of it as uh, control the temperature at the home, uh, control the lights. So uh, today I was talking to my wife uh, from the office, uh, accidentally opened the browser uh, on my phone. It was directed to my home uh, site and I turned off some of the lights at home, accidentally. <laughs> simply because uh, this was the last site that I opened on my phone. So these are things that uh, you can do uh, at home with, for example, Raspberry Pi or Arduino or something else connected. Uh, so when you have to um, set up your server, the first thing you have to uh, think about is the storage of the server. Okay, it can be used for storage, but uh, it actually requires a hard drive to run, right? And depending on uh, what you actually want to do is, uh, if you want to have a file storage at home, you can use FreeNAS, which is a free BSD based uh, distribution that uh, allows you to easily set up uh, network storage. Network attached storage is the abbreviation of uh, NAS. So, FreeNAS is uh, very nice uh, and it supports uh, one very interesting file system, ZFS, which allows you to create a software RAID, which means that you can combine multiple hard drives into a single file system and if uh, one of those hard drives fail, you are not losing the data. I will leave it at that. Uh, you can also use uh, Linux-based distributions like OpenMedia Vault, uh, Rockstar, or Amati. Uh, these are based on different Linux distributions, as we see Debian, uh, CentOS, Fedora. For these systems, you usually use either hardware aid or software aid, or uh, you use uh, BKRFS, which has some of the properties of ZFS. So you can create uh, software aid. Uh, inside of it. If uh, you decide to uh, use Linux for a router at home, uh, there are two ways. Uh, either you use Unix uh, free BSD or any of these free uh, Linux distributions. Debian has uh, unstable and testing. If you have a router and you want to be sure that it will work in a year, I prefer Debian stable. Uh, if you go to CentOS, then uh, this is the only distribution, they don't have variants of CentOS. And then uh, you have Ubuntu, Ubuntu has different vari uh, variants, and uh, LTS uh, means one-time support, so every time you are you know, going for a router, uh, you need one-time support distributions like Stable and uh, LTS. So for routers, these are the distributions that uh, you can choose. But keep in mind that uh, for these distributions, the kernels are usually a little bit older. So I prefer to install newer kernels from source. So run something like 4.5 uh, or newer uh, kernels on uh, your routers. This allows you to do a lot of uh, fancy network stuff that uh, are not supported in the older kernels because the software was not written at that point. <laughs> Uh, general purpose, if you want to combine uh, storage, uh, <coughs> network router, uh, a lot of other services on this machine, uh, it's only Debian, CentOS, and Ubuntu. Uh, here, usually, 
there are two, two fractions, uh, Debian guys and CentOS guys. So uh, most people go uh, with Debian or CentOS and that's it. Uh, there are some very rare cases where you can see uh, Ubuntu for general purpose Linux, but uh, not everyone is actually doing that. Uh, then uh, Dash of hardware for your phone machine. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, you can uh, have a mini ITX, uh, ITX uh, boxes. These are very small uh, form factor machines. Uh, boxes that can uh, host a full uh, motherboard, full computer with uh, the cooling and everything. This box actually can support 10 hard drives. So this is a very nice small box for uh, home NAS and 10 hard drives by 2 terabytes, 20 terabytes of data. Nice. For home, it's quite nice. Then there is the desktop. Uh, usually we have something like this. You, you, if you play any games, <laughs> this is something similar to uh, your uh, desktop machine. In this machine, actually, you can put uh, 5 hard drives here and uh, like 5 to uh, 7 more here. So you can create a storage from it you have the space for the video card and the uh, big cpu and uh, the cooler for it so this is also fine and uh, you can add uh, a few more LAN cards if you want to create a, a router big router out of it uh, this is uh, what i did in uh, my first years with the computers i added like four or five LAN cards on uh, the machine and I actually had a switch inside of the machine because of those uh, LAN cards. And there is uh, the machines that there, the machine that I use in the data centers, these are called rack mountable. Uh, they are mounted on racks. <laughs> uh, these machines are uh, measured by units. Uh, here you see four machines, each is one unit and one unit is this, the height of this uh, box. Usually they are long, like uh, 90 centimeters uh, long, and they're extremely noisy, extremely. Uh, they have like uh, 7 to 10 fans there. They're uh, high RPM fans, like uh, 12,000 RPMs, and uh, they don't care about the environment. So when we consider this machine here, this is a very quiet machine simply because these fans here, they are uh, <coughs> at uh, low RPMs and you can't hear them. While <laughs> these here, they have, the only idea of these fans is to work. They don't care about the noise that they're creating because they're in big rooms where there are only servers, there is nothing else. So, uh, after you have chosen the distribution, you have to choose uh, what to have for the storage. Uh, you can have hardware right. Uh, I don't prefer it, even though I have it at home. Uh, hardware right uh, actually gives you um, performance benefits uh, when you have old hard drives and uh, performance limitations when you have newer hard drives. Like if you have SSDs, like here I have this uh, chart. Uh, we have 100 megabytes per second, megabytes per second from SATA drives. Uh, usually you can get around 120 megabytes from a single SATA drive, but at 7.2 uh, uh, 7,200 uh, RPMs, uh, this is 100 megabytes generally that you get from this hard drive. And this is sequential read, which means that if you're copying a movie, it's 100 megabytes. If you're copying uh, very small files, like uh, all the documents that you have in the library, um, it's around 50, 54 megabytes per second. So it's very small. Uh, if you have SSD here, obviously you have uh, 540 megabytes per second, but you have to keep in mind that the hardware rate controller is a single rate controller connected to a single PCI Express uh, port. And depending on the rate controller, it can be uh, 3 gigabits per second, 6 gigabits per second, or 12 gigabits per second. So, 6 gigabits is uh, 6,000 megabits per second. Then, uh, divide this by 8, and you get the maximum megabytes per second that you get uh, from 
the six, uh, six gigabit controller. But if you have three gigabit controller, it actually limits you. And also, hardware uh, write controllers are made, usually older controllers are made, uh, especially for SATA drives. So they have buffers, they have a lot of uh, performance issues with SSDs. So you have to specifically configure the hardware write controller to work better with your SSDs or buy a new write controller. Which is stupid if you have another, uh, if you have more uh, CPU uh, for software. And uh, NVMEs, uh, do you guys know what this means here? Mm. Okay, so uh, SSDs are actually mm, pure RAM. They're uh, like normal RAM chips uh, soldered on a uh, board. And this board is then attached to a SATA controller. So this is the SATA protocol that is uh, uh, giving you uh, the data from uh, the chips. Unfortunately, uh, SATA, the SATA protocol was designed for rotational disks that uh, didn't have the performance uh, that SSDs have. So uh, these uh, controllers actually uh, reduce the performance of their uh, chips and you get only 540 megabytes per second. So some guys at uh, Intel, I think, decided why don't we connect the chips directly to the PCI Express plane? on the motherboard. So uh, they uh, created non-volatile memory uh, express lane, uh, which is uh, PCI Express directly to uh, memory. Then uh, in Linux, I don't know if this is supported at all at other, uh, on uh, other operating systems, but on Linux, we have a driver that you install and your hard drives are now uh, detected from your kernel like uh, you usually detect a video card or sound card or something like this additional control on your machine because they are simply on the PCI Express and because the chips are small uh, there are two uh, form factors that you can use uh, the standard uh, PCI Express by 4, by 8, by 16 directly on the motherboard or there are uh, the M2 slots that are smaller slots that you usually see on uh, laptops so you can plug directly these car, uh, car drives uh, I will op at the end of the presentation I will open uh, a few uh, pictures just to show you since you don't know what this is so since there, these chips are directly connected to the PCI Express lane uh, you actually get the maximum that you can get from the PCI Express lane this is depending on your CPU, you can get up to, uh, I now have at home two NVMEs that are 3.6 3 thousand megabytes per second. <laughs> I still haven't tested them, but uh, this is what the specs says, <laughs> so I'll try to uh, max them out. So, uh, hardware write controllers, they're good for old hard drives or for SATA drives. Not very good for SSD drives. Software RAID. Uh, what RAID means is a uh, redundant array of independent disks. So the idea is that you get uh, uh, not independent, inexpensive disks. Okay, so you get uh, some number of hard drives, like five hard drives and you want to make sure that you never lose data uh, you can have like first two hard drives uh, mir in mirror then the other two hard drives <coughs> in mirror which means that if one byte is written to one, uh, one drive it is also uh, written to the second drive the second to the same and if you want performance out of this uh, then you combine both RAID 1's into one RAID 0 which uh, uh, copies one byte to the two drives here and one byte to uh, the two drives uh, there. So they're on a round robin, so you get both the, uh, double the performance of these hard drives. And uh, you save the fifth hard drive for spare, so if one of the drives uh, fails, you directly uh, start copying the data to the fifth hard drive, so you would never lose your data, hopefully. Uh, so you can do this with the hardware, but you can also do it with the software if you don't need uh, uh, a lot of 
if you don't have a lot of hard drives like me, so if you have less than uh, six drives, there are a lot of motherboards that support eight or um, uh, six or eight SATA uh, ports. So you don't need additional uh, card for this. You can use software write for this. What software write uh, means is that uh, you have a driver in the Linux kernel that uh, does the same thing that the hardware was doing. Uh, it copies the data from one uh, to both drives here, to both drives here, and then combines the performance of uh, four of them. You can also use uh, LVM, which is Logical Volume Manager in uh, <coughs> Linux, which is a very old system that supports, uh, that is, was made to work with multiple hard drives. Like, uh, if you have a hard drive and you create a partition on this hard drive, the problem is that you cannot move this partition from one hard drive to another hard drive when you see that uh, the first one is uh, failing. So with LVM, you can uh, do this by simply issuing one single command and live without rebooting your machine, move all your data from one hard drive to another, remove this hard drive, replace it with another one, and then move the data again. Uh, you can uh, do a lot of other things like uh, thin provisioning and stuff like this, but I wouldn't bother you with that for now. Then, uh, when you decide what type of uh, uh, partitioning you, you will use with uh, hardware rate, with software rate, or LVM, you have to decide what file system you will be using. If you don't go with uh, RAID setups, you can use ZFS or BTRFS to get the same redundancy of your data. So, Every time you uh, have one byte written to one hard drive, it will be also written to another hard drive. Or you can, if you are par uh, paranoid, you can act actually set it up to um, copy the data to at least three hard drives. Uh, and <laughs> I see some <laughs> smiles here, but uh, I have read a lot of uh, papers about hard drives failing, and so what's happening is if you have two hard drives and one of them fails, within the next six hours, you have 80% chance of losing the other hard drive. <laughs> so, uh, copying the data from <laughs> free hard drives is not such a bad idea. Also, buying the hard drives, most people simply buy two hard drives, okay, order them online or go to the uh, service shop and ask uh, for two hard drives, which usually you get two hard drives with uh, uh, serial numbers one and serial numbers two. <laughs> so uh, they were manufactured in the same factory in the same day uh, on the same line. So if one fails today, most probably the other will fail today. <laughs> so uh, keeping your data on free hard drives may be a little bit better. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, when you have uh, hardware rights, uh, usually you get, uh, you create different devices with the hardware right. Uh, in Linux, you get uh, SDA, SDB, SDC, and so on. So these are um, virtual representations of a hardware right. With the hardware right, you actually get from uh, four hard drives, you can either get, uh, for example, if you have a RAID 10, you will get a single uh, device from the hardware RAID device. And on this single device, you can create partitions. With software RAID, you get all four hard drives and you have to create the RAID on it. And then you get one device that is called MD0, for example, if this is your first uh, MD device. If you're using uh, logical volumes, we can decide, okay, to create a single volume for uh, one thing, another volume for another thing, leave the rest of the space uh, unallocated, and uh, expand each volume depending on uh, how many, uh, how much data you have uh, on it and uh, when you want it. With partitioning on software and hardware rates, uh, you have problem uh, that uh, once you have created a partition, you can only extend it, but if you have another partition after it, you cannot extend it because the second partition is, uh, is in, uh, in the way. So what you can do is move your data from the second partition to another place, remove this partition, expand the first one, create uh, again the partition, move the data back, which is a lot of back and forth. 
which uh, LVM solves. But uh, you don't need LVM if you are going with uh, ZFS or BT with BTRFS. Uh, for small servers, you can use ZFS and BTRFS. We actually use both of them for our backup servers. 70% uh, of our backup servers use ZFS and 30% of them are using BTRFS. And these are big storage nodes like uh, 30 terabytes each. Uh, what I usually prefer to do when I'm setting up a Linux, it's a single partition for the boot. Uh, this means this is a partition where you put your kernel, your uh, boot files, your configuration files for the boot loader. I prefer to keep it around uh, 300 400 megabytes because uh, a single distribution of a kernel uh, from your operating system, like uh, from uh, Red Hat, it will be around 120 megabytes. If you have, uh, if you want to keep three of those, you need at least 400 megabytes. On my machines, on my laptop, I think I, this is around 500 megabytes because I keep like eight kernels. But my uh, entire the images are a lot smaller because I custom. Uh, custom made them for my laptop, so for my home servers. Uh, you need a separate partition for the OS, uh, for the operating system. Uh, you usually, on your machines, uh, I advise you to have a single partition for everything. It's a lot easier for you to manage. You don't need to expand partitions when uh, you need more space. You, need, you don't need to resize anything, which is uh, a lot easier for you. Uh, if you have a specific application that uh, you know is using a uh, certain amount of space, like a database server that you want to be limited to a certain amount of space, you can create a partition for that. Uh, usually if you have uh, big hard drives, like I'm supposing you have, like a terabyte or two terabytes, I would advise you if you want to keep the operating system out of the way of everything else to have at least 100 gigabytes for it. Standard installations of uh, Debian, Ubuntu or CentOS are around 8 to 10 gigabytes. Uh, this includes a lot of additional software. You can uh, trim this to around a gigabyte, which is not a problem, but uh, you would then install additional software, uh, so it's better to have more space for that. Also keep in mind that usually your logs are on the same partition where your operating system is. And if you forget to uh, log rotate, which I'll explain later, uh, you can very easily fill up uh, your hard drives with 100 gigabytes of logs. Uh, usually what uh, you can do is also have another partition for important stuff, like have a RAID 1, which is a mirror, copy one byte here and on the other hard drive also and after this operation is complete then the data is uh, copied on the hard drive. Then also you can have uh, another partition for everything else, uh, for example in write zero uh, where uh, data is uh, um, copied to both hard drives but uh, sequentially so if you have one terabyte hard drive in write zero you would get two terabytes of data uh, but if one of those hard drives fails, you're losing all of your data. Uh, so things like uh, the torrents you uh, downloaded yesterday, there on this uh, device here, on this partition. If you want everything to be protected, then you don't have this partitioning, and you only have important stuff and the uh, operating system, and that's it. My advice again, have only two partitions, the boot and the operating system, nothing else. That should be enough. And guys, you can stop me at any time and ask questions because you forget your questions and I would like to hear your questions, okay? So, encryption. By the way, about the partitions, uh, is there a difference between if you want to use it as a server, as I mean as a router or just as storage? No, there is no difference uh, in partitioning for you. Uh, I actually prefer to have only a single partition and the boot partition. Why you have the boot partition separately? Because uh, if you corrupt the file system on the partition that you are working on where your operating system is, 
uh, you would also if your boot holder is on the same partition, you would also curve the file system for the boot holder, and you would never recover the machine. While if you have uh, your boot holder on a separate partition, you can do stuff like uh, you can have uh, recovery in from uh, image which has uh, the file system check utils, uh, repair tools, SSH for remote logging, uh, and everything uh, on this machine without actually the per uh, booting the OS from uh, the faulty partition. So you can reboot the machine and uh, recover it even though you're not even at home. You can do this. If you have a single partition, you're fine. That's it. <laughs> so the next thing is uh, encryption. Uh, I'm a script guy and I prefer my machines to be uh, secure. So what will happen if, for example, some, uh, any one of you uh, steal my laptop? The moment uh, it's powered down or uh, its lid is closed, it will walk. And after you try to reboot it or boot it, it will ask you for a few passwords. Like, you need four passwords to log in on my machine. So uh, it would take you some time to get uh, some of the data from this uh, machine. And by some time, I'm thinking more like a hundreds of years. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully, until the uh, quantum computers are ready, it will work until then. <laughs> this encryption that I have. So you have a choice to make here. Should you uh, encrypt all of your hard drives? Encryption has some overhead. Uh, it's a small overhead, like five to eight uh, percent uh, overhead on uh, your I/O and CPU. But uh, it's very small, and it's more on the CPU and less on the uh, hard drives. So. Uh, Either you encrypt all of your hard drives, but you leave the boot partition unencrypted because otherwise you cannot boot. <laughs> uh, either you encrypt all of your data or some of it. So, uh, if you're encrypting all of your data, uh, Lux is your uh, standard way of doing this. Uh, which is done with LVM. So you definitely are going to LVM when you're encrypting. Uh, you can encrypt only some partitions, like the partition that had your important data, like your uh, photocopy of your passport, photocopy of your uh, proof certificate, and stuff like this. Important documents that when you lose your laptop, you're actually fucked. Uh, these documents allow a lot of people to do nasty stuff with you, without you knowing. So you want them encrypted. Uh, so you either encrypt your all drives, some of your partitions with the important data, or only some uh, directories. Why would you want to go only with certain directories? Because uh, <coughs> you have already installed your Linux, and you don't want to uh, reinstall it again because uh, converting your machine to LVM would require you to reinstall your Linux, or at least copy it somewhere else and copy it back. <laughs> uh, so at this point you may uh, choose to uh, encrypt only single uh, directories and for this you can use EcryptFS. Uh, it's, it's the same security that you get with the whole partition. The difference is that when you are encrypting all of your data, so all of your partitions, you are not leaking uh, additional data, like metadata, like you have installed this software or you have visited this site, which uh, this data is logged on, uh, some, uh, in some files in your uh, hard drive that you haven't encrypted. And for because of this, I would know that you have accessed this bank or uh, you have uh, bought uh, this thing from Amazon and stuff like this. So uh, I can get uh, additional metadata from your, from the data that you haven't encrypted. Uh, I personally prefer uh, EcryptFS because I'm running four different Linuxes on a single laptop 
without rebooting on a single uh, kernel. So uh, having uh, every Linux uh, with different encryption is a little bit uh, hard. Also, uh, I prefer to have uh, control of what is not encrypted and what is encrypted because I don't want all of my data encrypted. The problem with Lux is uh, that it changes the layout of your hard drive. So once your encrypted hard drive fails and uh, your partition is encrypted, there is no tool to recover your data at all because it was encrypted. The main idea was uh, it requires a password. And if the first uh, bytes that uh, hold, uh, hold your password from this hard drive, the hash, are broken, even though you have the correct password, there is no tool to fix uh, this encrypted partition. So when you're encrypting uh, only certain directories, they, uh, they're left as a normal file on the normal file system, and you have a tool for the normal file system to recover the file system if there is a problem. So you can lose a few files, but you would still recover the whole partition. This is why I don't like uh, full partition encryption. I have more control uh, file by file, director by director by director. And there is another problem with encrypting your hard drives. Uh, if this is a server and not your laptop or desktop machine, you are not in front of it when uh, the power uh, comes back. <laughs> so you had a power outage uh, at uh, your home and uh, your server is booting, but uh, it's now asking for a password. <laughs> And uh, this is a problem. And you can solve this. Uh, one of my colleagues told me about this. You can install SSH daemon with uh, your key on it, uh, with it, uh, in the boot of uh, your Linux inside of your uh, initrd. And uh, this first uh, boots this uh, Linux and waits for you to connect. You're connecting, then it asks you for the password for uh, decrypting your partitions, and then it boots. <laughs> so when you have all of your partitions encrypted, you cannot actually boot without password. While if you have uh, only some folders, like your home folder, encrypted, uh, you can boot, but uh, you cannot access your data until you enter your password. But you still can log in on this machine. So. You have to decide what, uh, what you want. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, this is it. In the init RD, you're putting an SSH daemon with your key, and that's it. It's not very hard. There are tutorials how to do this. Uh, when we have the Linux installed, yep. I have a password for booting, a different password when I boot it. Uh, I have a password for my hard drive, I have a password for uh, my boot loader, and I have a password for the login game on my machine. And I have a separate password for uh, changing build settings. How do you remember all of them? Is there a password for forgot the password? <laughs> There, are, on, on all of these, there is no password for forgotten password. Uh, I have forgotten one time uh, my password, uh, it was around uh, 2001, and I had to throw my hard drive away. <laughs> <coughs> so, it happens. Now, I simply remember these passwords. I actually remember only a few passwords, less than 10, so it's not a big issue for me. And uh, I change some of them regularly, so the, the ones that I use very, uh, very frequently, I change. Because uh, maybe you have seen what I have typed on my keyboard, I'm visiting a lot of conferences, you have seen my pin on my phone. I change the pin like every four weeks. You have a window of four weeks to uh, steal my phone. Uh, so, any other questions related to that? Okay. Uh, the first thing I do when uh, I have a server, a server installed is I disable uh, the services that are uh, started by default. 
So when I get a server, I get services really that I don't need. Like I have a printing server. Most of the time I don't configure this, so I don't need it, I disable it. I have a time server. If uh, this server doesn't require an actual uh, very correct time, let's keep it at this. Uh, I don't need the uh, NTP service running. Also, uh, sometimes you get uh, additional services like uh, some mem uh, memory caches or uh, file system share, uh, sharing service or network file server uh, protocols enabled. And I really don't need those. Since I don't need those, I disable everything except the services that I am supposed to run on this server. And for the beginning, uh, the only service, the only two services that uh, you're required to run is are uh, your syslog. So logging everything is very important in Linux and Unix. And then uh, it is uh, your SSH, so you can uh, get inside this Linux machine. Everything else you disable and then start to enable once you need it. Okay. Uh, disabling uh, these services are, uh, is not going to uh, stop them. So if even if you have disabled them, they are still running. So you have to stop them. <laughs> this is another issue with servers. Usually you get servers that uh, are constantly online. So the first time you boot it it continues to run until you actually power cycle the machine or reboot it uh, manually. So you, if you don't uh, stop the servers, it is still running. Uh, disabling all these services uh, speeds up your boot. So my laptop on the SATA hard drive was booting uh, in around uh, 45, 60 seconds which was very uncommon for Linux because uh, usually for the uh, graphical user interface uh, it was required around a uh, minute, like 90, 90 to uh, 100 seconds to get the uh, graphical interface running which was still faster than Windows but uh, uh, it was a lot of time then uh, you can examine what you're uh, welding on boot and uh, disabling these services will speed up your boot process because you're simply not reading from the hard drive stuff that you wouldn't, wouldn't be using. Uh, okay. mm, so, after I do this, uh, after you disable the services, there is a lot of software on your machine that, okay, what? Uh, do I have a script or is there a default script? Oh, uh, let's see, for uh, our company servers, uh, we have a lot of scripts that do this. For my servers, I usually do this manually because I don't reinstall Linux very often. For example, the uh, Swagware that I'm running from this machine on this laptop was installed in uh, 2000 or 2001 and it simply changed hard drives and machines along the years so no need to disable new services because <laughs> I, I'm not reinstalling it I'm simply copying it from one hard drive to another hard drive to another hard drive even for uh, at home I'm doing this so all my machines share the same base operating system that I installed and upgraded over the years so no, I don't need a script for that. Usually I'm installing new services and this is a one or two services that I'm installing and these I have to uh, check should I disable or not. Also there is another case, okay, I have new Linuxes with uh, uh, the Raspberry Pis at home. So when I log in on the Raspberry Pis, I start disabling uh, some services, but they don't run a lot of services. So usually there is the hardware detection service. since. I know that there wouldn't be new hardware on these machines because they're uh, at the attic or uh, in the basement. Uh, no one would actually go and plug anything to these Raspberry Pis at home. Uh, I know that I don't need the service that constantly checks. Uh, it's not constantly checking, but it listens from the kernel for new hardware and creating the device files. So stuff like this I disable.
I don't need them because I know that there is no new hardware. I don't care. Like uh, Raspberry Pi's also install uh, Bluetooth services. Why the hell should I need Bluetooth on a service on a device that actually doesn't have Bluetooth? Right? Or uh, the funny thing is when we are installing uh, servers um, in any of the data centers, CentOS by default installs uh, CUPS, Wi Fi, and Bluetooth. And CUPS is uh, the printing service. In the data center, there is no printer <laughs> at all. Uh, the machines don't, uh, don't have Wi Fi, they don't have Bluetooth. Why the hell I need this software? <laughs> First, I disable the service, then I go and uh, remove the software because this is useless software in these machines. Um, Unfortunately, when you start doing this, you would notice that uh, <laughs> uh, there are dependencies. And for example, if you want to remove cups uh, the standard way, it will remove half of your Linux. <laughs> so usually when I'm uh, removing the software, I'm removing it forcefully without uh, uh, telling the whole operating system, <laughs> just because I don't need these files. <laughs> Uh, reducing the amount of software you have on your machine is also reducing the attack, uh, the attack surface on your machine. What this means is that if you have one piece of software, this is one piece that can be attacked. If you have 10,000 pieces of software, you have 10,000 ways that you can be attacked. So removing the software is removing a lot of insecurity in your machine. And uh, just to explain this uh, in practice, at SiteGround we have our own operating system uh, for uh, our web hosting clients. Each client has uh, a copy of this uh, operating system. And uh, this operating system is limited only to libraries and binaries that are required to run all the different, uh, all possible websites that can be hosted on shared posting service. But they're modified in a way that uh, we don't have set huge uh, binaries, you don't, uh, you don't have compilers, you don't have headers, you don't have a lot of things that you normally have on your operating system. So, so we have limited uh, the functionality that our web hosting clients have but also we have limited uh, the functionality that our, uh, the attackers have on our machines. And uh, this helped us through the years a lot because uh, most of the you know, web hosting companies, they are looking through security bulletins and they're seeing, okay, there is a library that uh, has a buffer overflow, we have to upgrade immediately because uh, if this library is uh, affected, it may affect the whole server. On our machines, if this library is affected, it may affect only the user that is already compromised. So we don't care. Uh, we may upgrade it, or maybe we will leave it uh, as it is. And uh, it helps a lot in security because uh, <coughs> every week there are at least a hundred things that you have to upgrade on your machine. And when you have thousands of machines, <laughs> it's a hassle and a big one. So we don't want to do it. Reducing, uh, reducing your attack vector is very uh, nice thing. Even for your home machine. And for your home machine, just uh, let me explain it like this. Uh, we installed a surveillance video camera uh, at our office to uh, video record uh, the building of, your, uh, of our new building. And a week after I uh, allowed internet traffic to the video camera, which is running Linux by default, uh, it was hijacked by a virus. It's some kind of uh, Chinese video camera, I really don't care. We don't uh, have access to the Linux that it runs, it's uh, the way we got it from the manufacturer. But a week, only a week after we uh, allowed that internet access, against my suggestions at the office, uh, it was compromised. And we have to uh, restore it to the uh, factory defaults to actually log in on this machine. <laughs> so usually you get a lot of uh, fuck-ups in Linux without uh, securing your machine. 
after I remove all the necessary software, I upgrade to the latest kernel. If possible, uh, I compile the kernel in this machine for that uh, particular machine. I prefer to have uh, my latest kernel on the machine and if uh, the distribution like Debian Stable, uh, they don't have the latest kernels at all. With CentOS, there are a few repositories that give you newer kernels like you can get uh, 4.9 but the current latest is uh, 4.11 so uh, in 4.9 there are currently at least uh, 50 different attack vectors for the actual kernel so you don't want to run this you want to run the latest kernel and you're like okay what i'm going to do <laughs> i'm going to upgrade the kernel and this is usually why i'm choosing CentOS instead of uh, Debian because I have a little bit more recent uh, kernels there and a the more stable machine. You can get more stable kernels with Ubuntu and this is where the Debian guys switch to Ubuntu because they want newer software and a little bit of stability. Uh, there are things. Uh, after uh, I have removed the software, upgraded the kernel, the next thing is to prepare the machine for usage. So uh, I add uh, the additional uh, repositories that are normal for uh, these distributions. And the standard distrib uh, repositories from the uh, distributions give you like 20,000 packages. So this is not a very small number of software that you can choose from, but if you add uh, a few more repositories, you can get up to 80,000 different software packages that uh, you have access uh, directly from a single command to install. And this is the uh, Appel repository and PPA repositories for uh, Debian and uh, Ubuntu. These are different uh, repositories depending on what type of software you want to install, like uh, newer version of PostgreSQL or newer version of Mongo and stuff like this. Uh, these repositories are very important because without them you would lose a lot of time in searching for a package, downloading this package, uh, installing it manually. Otherwise you can use uh, yum install or apt-get install and you get everything without a hassle at all. After that, uh, I configure log rotate. Uh, keeping logs is very important. Uh, I usually keep the logs for my home machines like uh, for a month, uh, for our production servers, depending on which logs we are talking about, it's between three and nine months that we keep this information. So, logs are filling up your hard drives because there are a lot of text information and if you do a lot of things and usually when you like, experiment a lot of your, with your machine you get a lot of errors like for a single request you can generate uh, 50 or 60 or 100 lines of uh, uh, logs uh, because of errors <laughs> which is not a problem if you have logger tape which uh, you can configure to for example, when a file reaches one gigabyte, uh, you want to archive it and replace it with a new file. Uh, or you can say, okay, if this file reaches 10,000 lines, uh, rotate it and archive it. Archiving works, uh, since this is text data uh, with gzip, uh, it's around uh, 10 times more, like uh, one. Uh, 10 gigabytes log is going to be 1 gigabyte log. Uh, if you are using uh, bzip or uh, xz, uh, you can get uh, from 10 gigabytes, you can get around uh, 300 megabytes. So uh, this is uh, the compaction level that you can get with uh, archiving these logs. And then you can read them when you need them. Uh, configure log rotate for all of your logs is uh, very important because you would experiment with this machine. If you're not going to experiment with this machine, don't install Linux. You don't need that. You want to play with Linux. Uh, when, you, when you have a bigger machine, like uh, for example, this is your desktop machine that has, uh, for example, i5, i7 CPU with uh, 
uh, 8, uh, 16 gigabytes of RAM, uh, you may want to separate some services like your file storage, maybe on the, post, uh, on the post machine, but your web server that you're uh, serving your uh, blog or uh, your pictures, you want to separate even in a different virtual machine or container. Uh, why is that? Because then when this gets compromised, you won't uh, suffer with your uh, important data uh, leaking or uh, with your storage compromised because uh, these are different uh, partitions, different storage, and uh, different, different, different operating systems. So when your web server gets compromised, you install only the Linux for the web server, but uh, you don't need to install the whole machine. Every time your machine gets compromised, you have to uh, reinstall it. But if your software was in container, the, the compromised software was in container or virtual machine, you only need to reinstall those. And uh, what you can do is actually copy each virtual machine or uh, container every night. And uh, if this gets compromised, in the morning you will see that, and recover from backup, and completely remove the virtual machine or container, and that's it. It would be so easy to recover from this. And getting compromised is quite easy. So if you're running WordPress on your uh, server, uh, if you're not very careful, like every two to three weeks, there is a security uh, bulletin for WordPress or a plugin related to WordPress. So uh, you can get compromised pretty easily. And then uh, your machine gets on and you have to release that. Sometimes you may actually uh, get your files encrypted by a virus, <laughs> uh, or uh, you can uh, get your files deleted by someone, uh, because this is what these stupid people do. They compromise your machine, and instead of leaving you a note, uh, uh, this is a stupid security, uh, they're deleting your files. Uh, also, when you're configuring your services, uh, for most services that you would uh, configure, there are security guidelines. You simply Google for security guidelines for Redis, security guidelines for MySQL, security uh, guidelines for engines. There is a guideline that says, first step this, second step this, and so on. All the steps have to be met, and after that, you, you know that this service is as secure as possible for the default configuration of this service. Even if you don't know what uh, uh, some of the things that you did by this security guide, uh, if you don't understand them, it's okay. It's better to do this, uh, but try to verify the source. Like right? You don't need uh, some U Ukrainian site uh, that uh, is fishing you in uh, opening uh, ev everything on your service. You try to get uh, some proper uh, documentation like the Linux documentation project or uh, some blogs that are like uh, uh, Debian hacks or uh, what was it, tutorials, Linux tutorials or something like this. I don't remember these sites anymore. Uh, so you need to verify the site first. <laughs> if it looks credible, it's okay. <laughs> uh, not everything on uh, Stack Overflow uh, is uh, considered secure guideline. Uh, actually, I prefer not to include these things in uh, uh, my guidelines for our audience. Uh, network. Very important. <coughs> Configure your file. And uh, this is something that most people simply don't understand. It's not the internet uh, that you have to prevent to get into your house. You have to prevent you from fucking up the internet. That's the other way around. The problem is most uh, with the most devices on the, on the internet, the problem is not that they're attacked. It's that they are attacking someone else on the internet. So configuring your firewall in both directions. First, allow only incoming traffic 
to your services. If you don't run a service on this port, it has to be a forbidden port. You don't need packets going to, uh, to something that you're not listening on. Uh, if you don't uh, have this service at all, you don't need to, be, uh, to have this port open. When you have something running on your machine, you know which is the source port of it. So uh, the starting point, you know that starting point. So then you can allow only this traffic. This helps us a lot on uh, shared servers where uh, website gets compromised. They upload some software in it. And after that, this software tries to connect to the uh, DNS service to NTP service to some website. Uh, this is forbidden on our infrastructure. They cannot go directly uh, from our servers and ask something. Uh, this is very important because this prevents a lot of stupid things like our servers becoming part of a botnet that is controlled by IRC. We don't allow IRC on our servers. We don't have IRC services on our uh, servers then why should we allow the IRC ports? We don't. This is the same for your home server. If you don't have a service or don't need to access this type of service, you don't need to allow uh, these ports. Uh, allowing ongoing traffic is uh, the way you're protecting the internet. So first of all, you're protecting yourself from the internet by filtering everything that you are not listening for, uh, stopping everything there. And then the second thing is all the traffic that you generate. And if you think you don't generate the traffic, uh, I have uh, light bulbs that are with Wi-Fi. These devices try to connect to some server or server in Amazon uh, every minute like three or four times every minute. So I don't allow them to do that. I really don't care that they need to connect to something. They are my bulbs. This is my network. They don't have access to the internet. That's it. You come at my home. OK. I will give you the guest access to my Wi-Fi. You can do some stuff there. Some. Not every stuff. <laughs> everything. Because Again, I want to protect the internet from someone simply joining to my Wi-Fi. Your, uh, your laptop may, be, uh, having, uh, may have a malware on it. Uh, it may be part of a botnet. I really don't want my IP to get uh, uh, bad reputation because uh, someone came at my home. You're filtered, and that's it. Uh, if uh, you don't need, uh, if this is a server and not a router, you better disable the, for the forwarding. What this means is that if you have multiple interfaces like Wi-Fi and Ethernet or two, uh, two uh, uh, Ethernet cards, uh, when you enable forwarding, if one packet comes to uh, one interface, Linux will automatically route it through the other interface if, it not, uh, if it's not directed uh, for your machine and it, it is reachable via the other uh, interface. So forwarding should be disabled if this is not a router. Uh, if it is a router, however, and this is very important here, uh, Forwarding only traffic to or from your own network is very important. If someone joins to your network and you don't know about this IP address, you haven't given this IP address to this MAC address to this machine, you shouldn't allow them internet. That's it. Why? Because they may do stupid things on your network and your IP could get bad reputation because of this. Uh, I prefer to have MAC address filters. MAC addresses are uh, machine addresses on your physical devices. Yes, they can be changed. So uh, don't think that this is like written in stone. There is a simple command in Linux uh, that allows you to change your MAC address. Very simple command. Uh, but most people don't simply change their MAC addresses, uh, addresses constantly. So uh, normal devices, 
wouldn't change their MAC addresses and you're usually writing for this MAC address I will be giving IP address 2 for the next uh, MAC address 3 and so on in my home network uh, I have around 100 devices and each device is given static IP address it's not given automatically uh, I have personally checked what's the MAC address of this device and what IP address I want to give it to uh, it's good when this is a router it's good to install network monitoring software just to see what's happening in your network like for example in our offices uh, there are a lot of things that can happen like uh, a person may come with his uh, personal laptop open the laptop, connect to the uh, Wi-Fi his MAC address is uh, allowed because uh, he's a member of the company and uh, certain, uh, at certain moment I get a call and uh, this is my ISP uh, telling me that I should stop uh, sharing uh, what was it uh, intellectual proper, uh, property that I don't have rights to what this means is uh, some, uh, someone has uh, forgot their torrent client uh, open uh, on our company network and we were seeding a movie <laughs> <laughs> and they called me to tell me that they would stop uh, our internet connection because of that and this is normal thing usually American companies do this a lot more uh, but in Bulgaria it's very limited to only big companies that are doing this so they knew that we were seeding a movie and I called uh, some of the departments that uh, were um, suspected <laughs> and found out that uh, one of the trainers not the trainees <laughs> the trainers had forgotten his uh, uh, torrent to uh, client open after that I simply looked at the monitor and I found that uh, someone enabled the torrent client of one of our uh, network attached, uh, attached storage at the office and uh, it was uh, the head of the system <laughs> uh, simply downloading something from the network attached storage directly with the torrent client which was completely legit uh, when he was download downloading uh, uh, Linux uh, images for installing in the office but downloading, downloading them with the torrent client which I saw with the IP audit uh, uh, software and you can find other things like uh, suspicious IPs that your machines are connecting to like uh, we found out that uh, a few machines were part of a botnet inside of our office because the office managers actually clicked on a few links that they were not supposed to click and now we had uh, three machines at the office that were transmitting uh, up to three gigabytes a day uh, through the internet and you can actually see this uh, on the network monitor also if you install ArcWatch you can actually see when some computers change their MAC addresses which is very strange situation and when you find this you can find the guy and start uh, <coughs> doing some nasty things uh, so uh, network monitoring software very interesting it's not important but it's interesting it's funny to get uh, the information also uh, if you're curious uh, you can visit one very interesting site uh, what was it hmm. what did I download or what have I downloaded dot com uh, which tells you what torrents uh, you have downloaded from your IP you simply point, uh, give it your IP address and it will tell you a lot of stuff for you that you don't know you're sharing but the internet knows, knows that ok, so any questions? yeah? Uh, directly to the data center via the internet we don't have a VPN to the uh, data centers we were considering that but no need for now we have data centers in uh, Dallas, Houston, Phoenix, uh, Chicago, London, Milano, Amsterdam, uh, Madrid uh, and Singapore <laughs> we are not a small company <laughs>
And we have a small data center in our office uh, in Sofia, but it's only test machines, right? We have 12 machines there. <laughs> uh, other questions? Okay, so SSH. For me, the most important service that you have to run after the logging. <laughs> When you are configuring SSH, it's very important to disable password authentication. Passwords are from the past. You shouldn't use passwords for remote authentication. If you have to, try to set up a second factor authentication also, like uh, additional uh, hardware device uh, that has uh, uh, some time-based uh, one-time password thingy. Like you have similar things for uh, Blizzard for authenticating, for uh, PayPal, for your banking. Mm, try to set up something like this uh, when you need to set uh, to use passwords. For SSH, however, there is the SSH the SSH uh, keys uh, method. So disable password authentication. You don't need that. You shouldn't use that. Then the second thing is, if you don't have any strange uh, password uh, mechanisms inside your, uh, inside your network, disable the pluggable authentication modules. Um, then Kerberos. Kerberos is uh, something that Microsoft uh, uh, took over to uh, create global authentication schemes. Disable that. The other thing is uh, global service, whatever the fuck was this uh, API, uh, disable that. Global authentications at your home, nope. Then uh, the other thing is do not allow SSH under 2.0. They are compromised. If you're doing this uh, with, for example, uh, SSH 1.0, I have a very small program on my computer that uh, if we're on the same Wi-Fi, I will get your traffic and read it as it was plain text. And it would take me two to three minutes to start reading it as plain text. Uh, use very large RSA keys. Do not use DSA keys. DSA keys are uh, already broken uh, and currently their implementation is broken in uh, all of the distributions. So don't use DSA keys. If you have generated your DSA key and it was uh, 4K, uh, 4096, uh, before you have to generate that, generate that before, I think, 2006 or 2007, I don't remember. I think it was 2006. If you had this, uh, then your key is still safe, but the mechanism is not very safe. So use RSA. RSA 4096 is the minimum. And uh, I expect that it will be cracked by the end of this year or maybe uh, uh, second quarter of uh, next year, it would be uh, cracked. So my keys are 8192. And this is a requirement for everyone uh, in our company to have very big RSA keys. Uh, use privilege separation for SSH. Uh, this is the new default from uh, last week. If you have upgraded your uh, SSH to the latest SSH uh, from last week, it will do this uh, by default and will not allow you to disable that. What this means is that uh, when you're connecting to the server, uh, the server is uh, giving your uh, data that you're providing, uh, username and key data, to a process that is actually unprivileged. It is checking uh, your credentials, and after this process tells the other process that uh, your credentials are fine, then you are actually appointed to another process that is privileged and can uh, give you a shell access to the machine. So use privilege separation, it's important, it gives you uh, peace of mind when you're configuring the SSH. Doing this, is something standard for me and I don't run SSH services that don't implement all of these things. It's uh, completely stupid if you don't do this because uh, any of these is giving 
a lot more ways for the attacker to attack you and to actually break your system and uh, get this. Uh, securing the configuration, uh, a lot of the services allowed to root it. You probably don't know what this is, but uh, let's say that uh, it's isolation in the file system, so this service cannot uh, access uh, outside files, outside this directory. This is very important because uh, this way, uh, if your service gets compromised, it's only the files for this service that gets compromised and not the whole machine. Otherwise, if you don't root, if this service gets compromised, most probably in a few days time, uh, the whole machine will be compromised because there will be some other service file library that can be exploited. And then uh, this person will get root access and will completely replace your machine. We had, uh, in the past, like maybe eight, nine years ago, we had a machine that uh, was compromised and the attacker was so clever that uh, it actually replaced the kernel, rebooted the machine, and we couldn't see the uh, services that he was running from this machine. <laughs> so uh, the same thing happens to a lot of the uh, Windowses. Uh, you simply don't know that you're attacked. Uh, by default, uh, many services uh, have configs that are world readable. I prefer to disable this, so make them uh, only uh, root readable or readable only by the user that this service will run and no one, uh, nobody else. This way, uh, you wouldn't leak uh, configuration information for your services. Sometimes uh, configuration information is uh, very important for the attacker because depending on your configuration, there would be uh, different ways of attacking you. So disabling this, uh, preventing this information from leaking from your machine is very important. Uh, most of your operating systems, distributions, not most, every distribution that you would run uh, would install your kernel with all possible modules. And in the Linux kernel, there are like maybe 4,000 different modules, I'm not sure, I'm speculating here, but a lot of thousands of modules. And uh, these are thousands of attack vectors. Why should you have uh, a module for a modem? If your laptop doesn't have a modem or PSTN line or cable, if you don't have this device, why should you have the driver for it? And most people will tell, okay, it's not a problem, I don't have the device, I have the module, but I didn't load the module. Until a software requests the module to be loaded, because your uh, Linux allows you to uh, do auto-module loading. So if a uh, software on your machine requires a certain module on your uh, kernel, the kernel sees that you have requested this specific part that is part of this module and it loads the module for you. So if I'm an attacker, I got to your machine and I saw that, uh, for example, last week there was uh, an exploit for DCCP. Uh, this is another uh, protocol like uh, UDP. And uh, I simply need to write a simple program that uh, will generate a DCCP socket the kernel will load, uh, will load the module, then I will execute my exploit and I will become a root on your machine. I will become the administrator. And it requires only two commands. Uploading these uh, two binaries and turning them one after another. And I'm ready. And I can do this in a single command. So uh, this is a problem. If you want to be secure, remove everything <laughs> that you don't need. Uh, for my uh, case, I usually build my kernels for these machines. So uh, my kernel has only the uh, drivers for devices that I have on this machine. And also it has modules that would, I would actually use. So for example, if I'm not going to use the DCP on this device, I don't have it configured in the kernel. It doesn't exist on my machine. 
in your case, most probably you get a uh, simple a whole package with the kernel where you get all of these thousand volumes and you have to decide one, uh, one after another you know, which to remove it takes a lot of time so this is why I prefer to go the other way and simply choose what I want uh, when I'm configuring the kernel wait for a half an hour to build the kernel and it's done there are a lot of tutorials online how to build the kernel uh, a lot of people simply tell you this is the most dangerous and uh, the hardest part of Linux don't believe them it takes a little bit more time but uh, it's not a problem at all uh, my first Linux installation uh, a friend of mine came to my house uh, installed Linux on my uh, machine it was a uh, 486 machine on 30, uh, 33 megahertz and uh, he said, I'm, running so I'm leaving something to work on your machine. Tomorrow when it finishes, uh, if there is an error, call me to see what we can do. On the next day, not on the next day, even uh, during the night, I saw that uh, there was an error on the screen of uh, my machine. And uh, he actually left the kernel to, uh, to be compiled for my machine. And there was an error. And my first experience with Linux was configuring the kernel. Uh, I hardly knew English at that point. Uh, it took me a week to actually build the kernel and uh, maybe first two days simply to understand what it told me <laughs> because uh, I had to use dictionaries for half of the words. <laughs> it was fun. At least for me it was fun. It was a challenge uh, and I'm very happy that I'm doing this constantly now. When was it? Uh, I think 1994. I think it was then. Uh, it, it, it may be 1993, but uh, most probably it was 1994. <laughs> uh, so, uh, user setup uh, if you share this computer uh, with your significant other or uh, your brother or your mother or father. Uh, don't trust them this is my first rule uh, don't give your password to them uh, if you install the Linux you're the administrator of this machine they're not and they shouldn't be <laughs> uh, if uh, you have uh, some additional uh, secure stuff like the chats with uh, your girlfriend or uh, your second girlfriend uh, <laughs> or boyfriend, <laughs> uh, then uh, you may consider using EcryptFS even inside your current EcryptFS uh, <laughs> simply to have uh, this data additionally secured with another password that only you, you know and uh, you're not giving away easily. Uh, verify the permissions of all running apps so this way you, would n you wouldn't uh, leak data from uh, your user to another user uh, on uh, machines that uh, are running multiple users at the same time it's uh, very easy to uh, leave some folder uh, world readable and uh, worse uh, world writable and uh, allow your father for example to delete some of your files uh, he wouldn't know what, uh, what he's doing but uh, he may eventually delete some of your files so it's possible when you're using SSH uh, do not uh, first your SSH keys have to have passwords long passwords preferably like 30 characters long and uh, for passwords you are thinking now 30 characters, uh, characters are a lot but uh, I'll give you one very strong and very simple password which uh, a, an office manager of a company I worked with uh, told me the password is you shouldn't uh, you should remember to put a password this is the password you should remember to put a password with the spaces and everything and exclam exc exclamation mark at the end this is a very strong password because it's large, long password so uh, you should think about something that you can write very easily 
you can remember very easily. It's long, it's very long, and put this for a password. And then uh, every time I tell this something to uh, this to someone, maybe a sysadmin is uh, telling me, but I'm logging to so many machines every day, uh, I don't want to write down this uh, password every time. This is why you have SSH agent, guys. You write the password once, or once the key is unlocked in memory for the SSH agent. It provides the uh, credentials. You never need to uh, write the password again. There are automations for your SSH agent, uh, like script that can load the uh, path to the SSH agent for every new terminal that you're creating. So it will save you a lot of time without writing passwords. Uh, <coughs> any questions here? Okay. Um, I have a question. Yep. When you say about that password, the, the example you gave, uh, isn't that kind of insecure because you're using actual words? And if you use a dictionary, a dictionary to break, uh, you will find the words in fact easily. Depend regardless whether how long it is. Have you tried to crack a password? <laughs> no. Uh, so and not not directly. Like I'm trying to do this uh, like once a year mm -hmm. with our customers. Most of our customers have passwords up to eight symbols. Most of them, like eighty-three percent of uh, the customers, have uh, very uh, short passwords. Uh, now, 50% of uh, these passwords of our customers, and I don't have the passwords in clear text. I'm brute forcing them. On my machine, I have big video card with hashcat running through all the passwords uh, on our machines. But before the hashcat, I'm simply putting them through dictionaries. And 50% of these users are using passwords that are in these dictionaries. But they're short passwords. Then you have to create a password that is longer uh, from the dictionaries and uh, even with uh, a small dictionary you get uh, a very big uh, the list, the dictionary is uh, expanding exponential because you have tuples, tuples <laughs> and n, n by n <laughs> it's growing and now you, when you have 4x4 four four and your dictionary was uh, like uh, Let's say 10,000 words. 10,000 by 10,000 by 10,000. 10,000 on 10,000. It's not by. It's on. <laughs> so uh, it's a problem that uh, it cannot be solved very easily. Even if uh, you have only four words, it's still a lot of things that you have to do first. So four words or uh, even four words are enough. However, there is uh, something very strange, a lot of people are thinking that if you replace uh, the, the symbols like uh, T with 7, uh, o, o with 0 and stuff like this, you're making your password a lot stronger. You're not, because the dictionary has the, uh, the word password as the word password, then uh, the word password, but with S's uh, replaced by uh, door signs, then uh, with uh, O's replaced with uh, zeros and stuff like this. So you actually have all the variations of the word password with the different uh, symbols. And it's not very hard to uh, generate this list. Uh, I have written uh, software that generates this list. Also, uh, there is uh, coursework that you can do uh, in our courses uh, for network security that is only to create a generator of uh, word list generator. Uh, this is the words dictionaries that uh, you would be using for uh, testing the passwords. So uh, these dictionaries are available online. You can download them. Now, like for example, one of the dictionaries I use is two gigabytes of words, of text. You have to test all of them for each password. And let's say we have uh, half a million uh, uh, passwords that we want to test. Uh, it takes some time. If you have only a single password to test, I agree, in a week you will be finished <laughs> for a single password. <laughs> then you go with the next one and the next one. Uh, if you have uh, um, 
GPU like uh, NVIDIA with uh, which supports CUDA like um, 1080 for example NVIDIA 1080 you can crack a lot of passwords with it. <laughs> Uh, and you can do it uh, parallel, so uh, this one week can actually get to a few hours. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Then, uh, kernel setup. First, uh, if you want to understand what, uh, what was the problem that uh, caused your machine to panic, you can actually add this to the boot folder, uh, crash kernel, uh, and uh, give it at least 200 megabytes. This is the amount of memory that will be reserved for the second kernel that will be loaded after your machine crashes. And the second kernel will uh, load and dump uh, half or all of your memory to disk, and then you can analyze your, uh, what crashed on your machine. So this is a lot uh, easier. But this is only if you want to debug your machine, your kernel. If you don't want, then you don't need the crash kernel. The other things, however, are if your machine crashes for some reason, well, most of the time the kernel doesn't reboot the machine. So you can actually tell the kernel to reboot once uh, it detects the crash. Why? Right? The, the crashes in the kernel are panics. The kernel panics and doesn't know what to do. Uh, and when it panics, like uh, setting this to 5, it would say, okay, I will panic for 5 seconds and then I will reboot the machine. <laughs> I really don't know what else to do. <laughs> uh, so it, it's doing the uh, IT crowd uh, thing. Have you tried to turn it off and on again? It's doing it automatically after 5 seconds. This is uh, if uh, the machine doesn't continue to work for in 5 seconds, I should reboot. And it does, uh, it does reboot. Hard lockups. Most of you now are using uh, CPUs even on your phones that have more than one core, which means that you are running parallel uh, tasks. And sometimes some of these tasks uh, can block each other, like uh, trying to write the same file from, the, uh, from two CPUs at the same time and they clash, the kernel see this, and this is called hard walkup, and when uh, something like this is detected, you can panic. And when you're panicking, five seconds later, you're rebooting the machine. Why is this important? Because if this happens when uh, your machine is uh, 5,000 kilometers away, uh, it's not very good to start booking now the uh, flight to there to simply reboot the machine. You simply want to get the machine back and you see what happens, okay? Uh, panic on oops. So oopses are happening uh, if you're experimenting a lot with your kernel. Uh, the drivers on uh, your kernel may oops for something. And by oopsing, they mean, uh, oops, I did something wrong. Uh, I may continue, but... Uh, I'm not sure in what state I will leave the memory of the kernel. So you can decide, should you reboot or not? Uh, but if this happens at uh, 3 a.m. and you're sleeping or still drinking, uh, you don't want to decide should you reboot or not. And uh, it's a good idea to simply reboot, just to be on the safe side. Then uh, the other things, uh, Non-maskable interrupts, uh, NMI is called non-maskable interrupts. These are things that you cannot uh, control. The kernel receives them and have to act on them. These are hardware things. And if you cannot uh, recover from uh, non-maskable interrupts, this means that some of your CPUs, uh, some of your cores are working with the hardware on something. They don't, they don't uh, come back uh, to the operating system you may want to reboot because uh, if all of your uh, CPUs end up in uh, unrecovered NMI, uh, you don't, you don't uh, have other resources, other CPUs to work with. So you're actually, uh, your machine is actually stopped. So you don't have anything to do there. Unknown uh, NMI. This is usually caused by uh, faulty hardware 
or for example, if you have plugged a video card or sound card on the PCI Express swap and uh, it's not plugged very well, sometimes uh, simply moving, uh, walking by your machine, if this is a desktop machine, uh, walking by it may uh, trigger a known NMI because uh, there would be uh, electrical signal to the CPU that's unknown for it. Causing something like this uh, may be uh, a simple problem by uh, not very well put into your controller or a, a hardware failure inside uh, your motherboard or inside some of your controllers on your uh, motherboard. So you really want to have this when you receive a non AMI, you want to find the kernel simply to reboot it and uh, uh, the machine should enter a new uh, stable state again. And uh, NMI watchdog, this is uh, important because sometimes uh, even if you have configured all of these uh, before that, uh, your machine may stall and stay there for hours until somebody uh, goes there and re power cycles the machine. What you can do with uh, NMI watchdog is uh, tell the motherboard that uh, every few seconds, like every one second, uh, you would issue uh, an interrupt and uh, when this happens, the motherboard knows that uh, the CPU is still alive. If this doesn't happen, the motherboard will reboot the machine. Okay? And the last one is uh, most of your servers usually don't have uh, directly connected uh, monitor. Like if you're using Raspberry Pi, uh, you don't have uh, connected TV to it constantly. So what's happening is uh, you're, uh, you get an error, uh, it's displayed on the terminal, but uh, since the terminal is blank because it was left for a few days, uh, you cannot see the error. You're booting the, uh, the machine, but uh, you, you have lost the error. So uh, disabling uh, the blanking of uh, the console uh, allows you to simply plug a monitor to your computer and see there. If you haven't configured the other things, this will allow you simply to see the error. And also, uh, sometimes, like uh, if you disable uh, USB, for example, and your keyboard is USB and stuff like this, uh, you cannot trigger uh, with the mouse or uh, or a key on the keyboard, you cannot trigger the, uh, the removal of the blanking, so you can never see the console again after you boot it and a few minutes later the console uh, goes dark. So, uh, console blank is a good thing. Uh, these things here are the panic you add uh, in the boot holder, the crash kernel you add in the boot holder, uh, these things here you may add uh, on the boot order, but uh, uh, you can also add as syscontrols uh, sys uh, sys uh, in uh, etcsysctl.com. Any questions here? I know that this is a lot beyond you, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Any questions about this? You are satisfied with this only? <laughs> it was very too thorough, so. Uh, not really. <laughs>